Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Our esteemed viewers, on behalf of His Excellency Dr. Sultan Mohammed al naimi the Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, I would like to welcome you today to lecture number 756 of ECSSR's lecture series. Today's lecture is titled The Global Role of the United Arab Emirates at the United Nations. Our speaker today is Her Excellency Ambassador Lana Zaki Nasiba, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the United Arab Emirates to the United Nations. Ambassador Nasiba was the UAE's first female delegate to the UN and has been named President of UN Women. Your Excellency, we are delighted to have you with us today following Emirati Women's Day, which was this past Friday, August 28th. I now invite you to give us your insights, and afterward, I will be asking a few questions. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Aisha, and I'd like to first thank the ECSSR and thank you as our moderator, uh, Aisha, for inviting me today. I'm really honored to be celebrating Emirati Women's Day with you this year uh, from New York. The UAE in 2021 will celebrate the 50th anniversary of its founding. That celebration is also a powerful moment to reflect on how far we have come as a country. Many doubted that our country could flourish back in 1971, but we have forged a strong and enduring union. We transitioned from an economy that depended on fishing and pearl diving to being one of the world's largest energy providers. Today, we proudly look forward to a post-oil knowledge-based economy in which the UAE is a global leader in science, technology, and innovation. We founded world-class cultural and educational institutions such as NYU and Sorbonne University in Abu Dhabi, the Dubai Opera House, and the Louvre Museum, as well as creating a thriving entrepreneurial economy that has helped us attract one of the world's most diverse populations with more than 200 nationalities and people of all faiths living side by side here. This year, we launched the Arab world's first Mars mission, and next year, we will be welcoming more than 190 countries to the UAE, to Dubai for the Expo. Not a bad track record in just 50 years. But as the UAE developed domestically, we recognized the importance of having a presence on the global stage. And I've served as the UAE's ambassador and permanent representative since, since 2013, the first female, as you pointed out. The United Nations is a critical organization for the UAE's foreign policy, as it is a global platform where all countries can potentially make a big impact. All member states get an equal vote, and there are strategic opportunities for the UAE to take leadership roles on global issues, as well as develop partnerships with like-minded countries. As a country sitting in a region troubled by destabilizing actors and extremist groups, the UAE is committed to upholding the principle of multilateralism and international cooperation particularly in the pursuit of global peace, security, and sustainable development. The UAE has made significant strides to address the emerging challenges of the 21st century. Many of these challenges span across borders, including climate change, terrorism, and the struggle for gender equality. The transnational nature of these challenges is one reason why the UN is a critical forum to share our story with the world and lead by example. 2020 is a landmark year for the multilateral system as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the UN, of the UN General Assembly in September, and we've outlined a number of our priorities for the year ahead. First and foremost, the UAE is committed to the stability and security of our region, particularly efforts to de-escalate conflicts, combat terrorism and extremism, and to remove weapons of mass destruction from the Middle East. So a critical element of regional stability is promoting tolerance, coexistence, and interfaith dialogue. We will continue to build on the historic visit of His Holiness Pope Francis to the UAE in 2019 when he signed the document on human fraternity for world peace and living together with Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, 
At the UN, we've been working to convene dialogues with faith leaders, UN officials, and other member states. We want to demonstrate to the world how the UAE's diversity has helped us to flourish, both economically and culturally, and that we are promoting tolerance to combat hate speech and incitement to violence. The UAE is also committed to providing humanitarian and development assistance to countries and communities in need around the world. Since the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the UAE has provided medical supplies to more than 100 countries and has partnered with the World Health Organization and the World Food Program to deliver testing kits, personal protective equipment, PPE, and other necessary supplies to those in need. Dubai International Humanitarian City, a major hub for UN logistics, has handled 80% of the PPE distributed by the WHO. Health diplomacy has become the core work of our foreign policy today. And as the world grapples with COVID-19, we're reminded of another global challenge, climate change. This is a domestic and foreign policy priority for the EE, as we are a country vulnerable to the effects of climate change and also one of the world's largest producers of fossil fuels. As you may know, there are major initiatives underway at home to mitigate the impact of climate change, including reducing the cost of renewable energy, as well as investing in vertical farming to enhance food security. The UAE is known at the UN as a champion for climate action, for its efforts to promote renewable energy, as well as our early recognition of the impact that climate change has on a range of issues, including security and public health. This is why we have the most concrete and ambitious UN commitment on climate change in the Arab world, which includes having 40% of our energy mix come from renewables and a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We're eager to continue promoting the UAE's green energy model on the world stage, as we also reiterate the importance of multilateralism in addressing climate change. Another principle that is key to both the UAE's domestic and foreign policy, and you've pointed it out, Aisha, in your opening remarks, is gender equality and women's empowerment. As we celebrate Emirati Women's Day, I'm reminded of the progress that we have made in this area and how we're now a model for gender equality in a region and world that often excludes women from participating in politics, the economy, and society. 2020 is a significant year for gender equality at the UN as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference, where governments from around the world agreed on a comprehensive plan to achieve gender equality. It is also the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325, which officially recognized the impact of armed conflict on women and girls, as well as the role of women in peace building and conflict resolution. We're so eager to promote the inclusion of youth across all aspects of social and political life, both at home and in multilateral institutions. With 34% of the UAE's population under the age of 25, we cannot plan for a future without our youth. Additionally, global challenges such as climate change will disproportionately affect young people. And it's critical that member states, in a genuine partnership with the UN system and the world's youth, include them in global decision making. One of the most far reaching initiatives of the UN is the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. These 17 goals form the core of the UN's development priorities, and the UAE has integrated them into our own national strategy. Vision 2021 and our foreign aid policies as well. Sustainability is also a major theme of Expo, where we will bring together more than 190 countries to showcase best practices for sustainable development. Lastly, the UAE is known as, at the UN as a country focused on technological innovation and scientific development. So we launched the Arab world's first Mars probe last month, and we have one of the most advanced digital economies in the region. At the UN, we supported the Secretary General's efforts in fostering a global conversation on digital cooperation. And we're committed to harnessing emerging technologies for the world's benefit. For example, technological solutions for online education and work from home arrangements have allowed us to better cope with the impacts of COVID-19. And we're keen to share best practices at the UN for future challenges, including pandemics. So what does 2022 look like for us? In 2022, we hope to elevate our global engagement across the board by taking a seat on the UN Security Council.
As you may know, the Security Council is composed of 15 countries, including five permanent members, China, France, Russia, the UK, and the United States, and 10 elected members from different regional groups who serve two-year terms. The UAE has been recently endorsed by the Asia-Pacific Group, as well as the League of Arab States, and we hope to enjoy robust support from the wider membership as well as we take our seat. The Security Council is responsible for the maintenance of international peace and security, as well as UN peace operations and humanitarian operations around the world. Being a member of the Council will be an extraordinary experience for the UAE, and we hope it will create a number of opportunities for us as well and for our diplomatic team. For one thing, it will give us a strong voice in matters of peace and security, particularly given that many agenda items of the Council concern situations in the Middle East. It will also reinforce the UAE's commitment to strengthening multilateralism and building bridges with other countries. And it will bring the UAE's innovation and forward-looking vision to the Council so that it may be applied to the world's most pressing challenges. We are excited to see what the year holds for us at the UN, and I'm very excited to discuss our plans with you today. I know we have a Q&A session coming up, and I'm keen to take your questions and answer in the best way that I can. Uh, and to you and to the ECSSR, again, thank you for hosting me. It really is an honor, and I hope you're keeping well and safe. Thank you for this overview, Your Excellency. And now I have a few questions for you. As an ambassador and permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates to the United Nations, tell us about your role in influencing other countries to adopt UAE's approach in empowering women and promoting gender equality. Well, thank you for that first question, Aisha. And I'd like to say at the outset that under uh, the leadership of Her Highness Sheikha Fatima bint Mubarak, the promotion of gender equality, not just in our country, but around the world, is also a foreign policy priority uh, of the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs and across the government sector broadly. And at the UN, it is my job to promote that vision that we have learned in the UAE that a more equal society is a more stable and a more prosperous society. And I'd like to quote here uh, the uh, managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, who recently said that the book on gender equality, the econ economics of gender equality is a book that is already written. Because we already know that if we were to wake up tomorrow uh, and men and women were suddenly equal around the world, we could add 173 trillion US dollars to the global economy. So this is not just smart foreign policy. It's not just the right thing to do. It's smart economic policy. It covers all the different areas uh, in terms of how governments make decisions and why they make decisions. It's the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. And I think we promote that vision at the UN every day in my work. To give you a couple of examples, you mentioned at the outset that I was president of the UN Women Executive Board. UN Women is the UN agency entrusted with the mandate of empowering women uh, worldwide. And we have been one of the top 20 donors to that entity uh, for the past several years, giving annually 5 million US dollars to that organization to promote gender empowerment around the world. And when I was president of the UN Women Executive Board, I ensured that this was cross-cutting across the UN system. So we don't just talk about gender empowerment in a silo, we talk about it in every issue that we discuss, and in particular, the issue of peace and security. Sometimes the gender file is relegated to the area of society, community, social concerns. But in the UAE, gender empowerment is seen as a core pillar of peace and security, of countering the narratives of extremism and terrorism, of creating stable and prosperous societies when women are at the decision-making table. And we already know that better decisions are taken when women are at the decision-making table. The UAE has a great story to tell on this subject, and I try and tell that story every day at the UN, not because we're boasting, but because we humbly offer our experience of being a proud Arab Muslim nation that is tolerant, that has a diversity and pluralistic society, a diversity of communities living in the UAE in a pluralistic society, uh, many faiths worshiping side by side. Uh, and it has also demonstrated through our quota systems, whether it's 
to our Federal National Council Parliament, whether it's our percentage quota on uh, boards in the UAE and the private sector, uh, whether it's in the foreign ministry, we're trying to equal uh, parity in terms of men and women in the diplomatic service. And I'm proud to say that seven out of my 10 diplomats here in the UAE mission to the UN are women. In across these fields, I think the UAE uh, walks the walk. We do what we say is the right thing to do. On the women, peace and security file, uh, I think women, peace and security is an incredibly important topic. And it's one that we intend to champion uh, when we are on the Security Council ourselves. And so, for example, we already know from data and studies that peace agreements will more likely last 15 years and above when women were part of the peace negotiations as opposed to failing after five years. So again, the data proves the philosophy that underpins the UAE and has underpinned the UAE since its founding, that having women uh, as partners to men in our society creates a more stable and more prosperous society. And that's why 70% of our graduates in the UAE are women, 44% of our working sector are women, and you already know the numbers uh, are very high for our cabinet, uh, a quarter of our cabinet are female or a third. Um, so I think the numbers speak to themselves. We are committed to this. Uh, the Gender Balance Council in the UAE is working extremely hard to tie up our domestic policies with international best practice, whether it's in gender-based budgeting, whether it's in our domestic policies, whether it's in terms of how we promote ourselves regionally and internationally, uh, and whether it is in terms of how we bring up our youth in our educational systems to understand that the basis of a stable society is a gender equal society. That's the message I take every day to the UN, and it is with gratitude to Her Highness Sheikha Fatima that the UAE has been this success story uh, on women from the very beginning, from the very outset. We did not have the kinds of debates that we sometimes see in other countries around this. It was always that way. And of course, that is also due to the very wise uh, leadership uh, that we have in our country, um, in, our, in our leaders, because they also understand and, under and want to bring the best of their society to the table, which is why women are at the top tables in every sector. Thank you, Your Excellency. Emirati women have achieved great success in many areas and high levels of empowerment, uh, especially in economic, political and diplomatic fields. Do you think women in the UAE still face any challenges? And if so, can you tell us these challenges and how can they be overcome? So we've made great progress, but of course, I think one of our strengths as a country is the way we look at ourselves in the mirror and we try uh, and do better. We try and offer a model that is aspirational uh, for the region, for the world. Uh, and so, of course, there are still strides to be made, but we have made incredible strides for a country in our part of the world and internationally. And that's often recognized in the many international forum that I sit in. Uh, but I think we can still close some of the gender gaps. Equality is, of course, parity, 50-50. And I think that's what the General Women's Union, uh, under the leadership of Her Highness Sheikh Fatima, and of course, the Gender Balance Council is working on, is parity in the boards of both of our uh, private sector and our government entities. Parity in, uh, eventually, the, His Highness the Prime Minister has already announced uh, that he wants to see gender parity in his cabinet in the future. I think in our diplomatic service, I'm proudly one of several female ambassadors, but I know that it is the vision uh, of His Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nahyan to uh, promote gender parity across the diplomatic service, including in the number of female ambassadors abroad. And so there are areas, of course, like with any country, there are areas for improvement. And I think we are working on those areas because in order to close the gap, Another study has shown that if we were to allow it to close organically or naturally, it might take over 100 years to close the gender gap. So we understand in the UAE that we actually need to follow and pursue active policies to close that gender gap. And we don't just do that for ourselves. And I want to mention here a very specific initiative related to the role of women in peace and security that has been spearheaded in the UAE in a special cooperation agreement between our Ministry of Defense UN Women 
uh, and and uh, the mission here in New York. We partnered with the General Women's Union uh, as well, and we are training cohorts of women in the WPS field, in the Women, Peace, and Security field. We've graduated already uh, 134 cohorts in the first edition. We've graduated an additional 223, and not just from our region, but a cross section of countries from Asia and Africa have come to the UAE and have taken training in order to be able to be part of this pipeline of women peacekeepers around the world. And this is a really important an initiative and a very moving one, uh, spearheaded by Her Highness Sheikha Fatima and with her support. And it's one that I'm very proud to talk about here at the UN because, of course, peacekeeping forms a big part uh, of UN operations worldwide. And there is an opportunity here to help deal with injustices in those peacekeeping operations when they occur. Uh, so, for example, the issue of violence against women uh, in conflict. Uh, we've already seen the data that shows that when there are more women peacekeepers in those situations, there are less inc instances of the, that violence being perpetrated against women in those societies. So there are a number of initiatives that we're working on that I'm incredibly pr proud of uh, and that speak to our visionary approach uh, to gender empowerment as a core pillar of peace and security, not only in our own region, but around the world as well. Thank you, Ambassador. The UAE is a pioneer in humanitarian work, especially in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. As an ambassador, how do you see this effort enhancing international and global cooperation in such extraordinary circumstances? I think COVID-19, it's an understatement to say that it's been one of the largest paradigm shifts of the last century for the international community. It's changed everything. Uh, and at the same time, the UAE, I'm proud to say, has been one of the countries that very early on understood that we are as strong as our weakest link, that in order for all of us to overcome this global pandemic, we needed to start helping as many countries and as many people as possible as quickly as we could. We were in a, I would say, a remarkable situation uh, when COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, a global pandemic because we had already scaled up uh, and were prepared thanks to a very visionary leadership in our country for a global pandemic such as this one. And we were able to scale up our policies, our testing uh, and our containment of the virus, which knows no borders, no nationalities, no ethnic groups very quickly. And our approach was immediate and it was egalitarian across uh, societies in the different communities that live in the UAE. And I think that we are going to see around the world uh, that that is a correct approach, that you need to be uh, very fast moving in order to save lives in your country. And that's what we did. So the other remarkable thing, uh, and I'm obviously biased on this, but I think COVID-19 demonstrated that humanitarian aid, which was one of the founding principles of our country, and of our uh, first ruler and president of the UAE, His Highness Sheikh Zayed, that humanitarian aid is just part of UAE DNA. It's part of who we are as a society. So to date, we've given humanitarian aid around COVID-19, whether it's in testing kits or personal protective equipment or technology transfer or know-how, to over 100 countries around the world. And we did that very, very quickly and without discrimination to who was asking if they were in need, our foreign ministry uh, in collaboration with the other relevant entities and government um, made, made that donation possible. And I was at the center of a lot of that being that at the UN, we also cover uh, aid in countries that we don't have embassies at. And so for example, in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, we've been a big actor there, but also around the world. Any country that has asked us has received help in the space of battling COVID-19. And I think that's been quite extraordinary. Of course, our preparedness goes back uh, a few years, uh, at least to prior to the pandemic, because the establishment of the Dubai humanitarian city as a logistics and humanitarian aid hub was a visionary for its time. 
And today it is the largest logistics humanitarian aid hub that the UN utilizes in combating COVID-19 and in giving assistance around the world. So that's all part of our vision of preparedness. And I think we've been working on this vision for decades uh, in our country. Uh, we've given $10 million worth of test kits to the World Health Organization. We did that very early on in February. And we also helped create an air bridge operation for the UN to medvac UN uh, workers from around the region to the UAE if they needed medical assistance. We helped create an air bridge to make sure PPE supplies continued to flow even when flights and logistic flights were stopping and commercial airlines were ground to a halt. And so in all of these things, I would say that COVID-19 brought out a pioneering almost foreign policy from uh, the UAE government in not only responding to the challenge looking in, but responding to the challenge by looking out immediately and seeing where we could be of assistance to our fellow man and woman. And I think that, as I said, goes back to a core principle that is part of the UAE's founding principles in terms of giving, but it also creates a new area, a new space. The so COVID-19 pandemic creates a new space in health diplomacy uh, to the extent and scale that I have not seen in my time in government and that is very exciting to be a part of. Thank you, Ambassador. The 75th session of the United Nations General Assembly will be open on Tuesday, September 15, 2020. What are the UAE's priorities for the Assembly? Well, COVID-19 has also impacted the General Assembly, so a decision has been taken that world leaders will not fly into New York and there won't be the usual speed dating, as we call it, uh, approach to diplomatic meetings where you arrange for your principal, your foreign minister, uh, upward of 30, 40 meetings in a day sometimes, um, His Highness would have in previous years, uh, moving from uh, booth to booth in the UN and of course really dealing and tackling with uh, key issues that we are facing in our region and around the world. That has changed and because of the lack of face-to-face -face meetings, I have to be frank and tell you that diplomacy has therefore changed. And we don't know today what that impact will be on peace and security, on fostering uh, bilateral ties with other countries, on trying to de-escalate tensions where tensions exist, on finding diplomatic breakthroughs. And I think that the impact of COVID-19 on diplomacy is a book yet to be written, but it is one that we're all very much a part of. And we are all very committed, therefore, at this UNGA, where delegations will be making pre-recorded statements at the UN. And of course, His Highness uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Nahyan, our foreign minister, will be outlining the UAE's approach both to COVID-19, but to issues that face our region and the world we will be recommitting ourselves in this very critical juncture for multilateralism to the multilateral system, to the world order that we are all a part of and that benefits all of us. And I think that is the most important priority uh, for this, Anga, is that recommitment at the 75th anniversary of the UN that for all states, large and small, the international system, the rules-based order that emerged after World War II remains relevant, remains important, uh, because without it, we revert to law of the jungle, uh, might is right, the, the bigger you are, the more powerful you are, uh, the more of the pie you take in the, in the playground, as it were, in the playground of global affairs. So I think that's number one. I think number two is we will all be reflecting at this anger how to approach not only the pandemic of COVID-19, which is enormous with economic repercussions that have yet to be felt, but also how do we tackle the existing issues and challenges that existed prior to COVID-19 and that for many countries have taken a little bit of a back burner, again, if I'm frank. So whether it's tackling extremism, terrorism, water security, food security, both huge issues in our region, uh, climate change, uh, financial money laundering, all of these transnational cross-border issues remain and they need to be addressed. 
There is growing division in our international community. And I think the UAE sees itself as a bridge building country and a country that can reaffirm where we are more alike than we are dissimilar. I think that's another priority for us at the UN, bringing that global cooperation, that sense that, sense that we are stronger together, that we are stronger united than we are divided back to uh, the international community is something we will certainly be putting forward. And lastly, of course, another priority, aside from those two very fundamental ones, uh, is of course that we are in a challenging region, that we are facing numerous challenges across that region for a stable uh, Arab uh, Middle East order to emerge that offers a vision of opportunity and hope for the more than 60% of youth across our region for whom we have to create millions and millions of jobs by 2050 in an economy ravaged by COVID-19 and potentially future pandemics. So it's a huge undertaking. And I think the UAE is part of that camp that is looking to the future, not looking to the past, but looking to the future, looking to the aspirations of our region uh, and trying to work with other like-minded countries to make sure those aspirations come to pass. That is what we owe uh, our children and our grandchildren. And I think that is very much something that our leadership feel that sense of historic responsibility at this critical juncture. So the regional challenges, regional issues will also, of course, as always, be a priority at this UNRWA. Thank you. At the end of this lecture, and on behalf of His Excellency Dr. Sultan Mohammed Al Naimi, we would like once again to thank Her Excellency Ambassador Lana Zaki Nasiba for her lecture, as well as our esteemed viewers. We look forward to welcoming you to our future events. Thank you.